First, let me just begin by explaining the title. Uh, is, as it has been commented on uh, by many people uh, over the course of the last two days, uh, homicide, crime rates, at least as measured by homicides, have been falling uh, across the globe. Um, uh, in, not only in the United States and Western Europe, where there have been declines of about 50%, uh, it's also declining um, in the developing world. I just came back from Colombia uh, last week, and there's been a two-thirds decline. Mm -hmm. There are, however, places where uh, uh, rates of violence are, are increasing. I understand in South Africa and otherwise. But more generally, another comment which Manuel emphasized is that we don't really understand why crime rates rise and fall. And just like uh, stock markets, um, um, I think it's a pretty good bet at some point we're going to see rising, not falling crime rates. And, and I, this talk is about uh, how the criminal justice system should respond. Um, and let me actually begin on that point just to reinforce still another point that, uh, that Friedrich made. Uh, many people from a public health background here at the conference um, you know, think of violence in terms of a, being a public health problem. Uh, but most forms of violence that we're talking about are also criminal acts. And being criminal acts, they do require a, a response from the criminal justice system. And that response it takes two distinct forms. Um, one form is how should it respond in a way to confirm the social contract? And a separate but related issue is how should it respond to prevent crime? I am going to speak mostly about the second issue. And I think that uh, Mike Conry, who's going to follow me, has a good deal to say about the first issue. Um, so, uh, and also, uh, much of what I'm going to say is motivated by what's happened in my own country, the United States. Uh, we have 5% of the population and 25% of the prisoners um, in, in, in the world. Um, I think that uh, what has happened in the United States is important to other countries for two reasons. <clears throat> One is it's largely instructive about what shouldn't be done. Uh, and uh, it's also uh, instructive to some countries uh, which uh, are also experiencing substantial increases in crime in, in imprisonment rates. As I said, I'm just back from Latin America and Colombia, for example, and, and many other countries in Latin America also have rising imprisonment rates. Um, so I'll begin with the, the point that an admonition that Cesar Beccaria made more than uh, uh, 200 years ago, 250 years ago, that it's better to prevent crimes than punish them. Um, now, what we think about that is, is that it's important to keep in mind that there are many social forces that are well beyond the reach of the criminal justice system um, that can be used to prevent crimes. One which we've heard a lot about already, our, our early childhood type of enrichment programs. But one thing, just too quickly, two things that we've heard less about, which seem to me to be comparably important, is understanding the relationship between drugs and crime. And I mean this more than just drug cartel, cartels. I mean it in terms of people uh, committing crimes to, because they're drug addicted. And something we've heard even less about is addressing the issue of the relationship between mental health and crime. In, again, in the United States, we now have our jails and prisons, not our mental institutions, have the largest institutionalized pop population of people with mental illness. So now I, though, want to move on to the criminal justice response. Um, over the last uh, couple of years, I've done a number of reviews of the literature, mostly for Mike Connery, and, and his role as editor of the, uh, uh, the series Crime and Justice. And I want to uh, quickly move through some of the conclusions I've reached based on um, about the crime prevention effects of imprisonment. The first one is that American style in, in, uh, in, incapacitation is an in, in, inefficient and also unjust method of crime control. And I say that for two reasons. One is that, it, is that age is nature's best cure for crime, and the other is the extreme skew in offending rates. So, 
as an example of what I mean by age being the, the, uh, the uh, best cure for crime, this is a, 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 a uh, this, this analysis shows a, a, an application of a method actually that I developed called group-based trajectory modeling um, to a date, an American data set composed of uh, 500 males who in age, from the, who were born in the 20s and who were incarcerated in a, in a juvenile facility. And this shows the relationship between their offending rates and uh, police contacts and age. And the thing that I want to bring to your attention is that first of all, there's no one age crime curve. Um, but even for the highest rate chronic group um, uh, up there, uh, it reached its, its, its cheap peak age of offending at age 35, and, there, and thereafter, there's a steep decline thereafter. Uh, this is another application of group-based trajectory modeling uh, to a, a data set that David Farrington here in at, at the University of Cambridge assembled, and it's composed of about 400 British males who were born in the, in the early 50s. And again, the same, you see the same pattern that there are many different tra trajectories of offending, but here the, uh, the, uh, the peak age of offending uh, is, at, you know, is, about, is, is far younger in the, in the, in the 19, in 1920s. And the key point here is that incarcerating old offenders is not an effective way, an efficient way of preventing crime. Another part, important point that I reached is that high rate offenders are a small fraction of total offenders. Um, so for example, in the two prior examples I gave you is the chronic trajectories are a very small uh, fraction of the total. They're all, both less than 5% of the sample population. This replicates a finding, an earlier finding, uh, from the United States that, Wolf, uh, that Marvin Wolfgang made more than 50 years ago, in which he looked at offending in a, birth co a US birth cohort, that 6% of the cohort accounted for 50% of the crimes. Um, in the Farrington data, which I just described, 8% of the sample accounted for 53% of the convictions. And a very recent, this is an American uh, study, which a contemporary American study, that two to five percent of the sample uh, accounted for 50 percent of the self-reported offending. And this is a histogram of the offending rates uh, uh, for the Pathways group uh, study. And um, there's just a small group of, of 20, 20 plus uh, of, of the group who, uh, who committed 20 or 200 or more crimes. And the interesting question is, can these uh, people be ide uh, identified before the fact and, uh, and, and, and so therefore be uh, the subject of a kind of selective incapacitation uh, uh, strategy? I could talk at length about this, but all attempts to do this in the past have, have resulted have been abysmal failures. And um, there are now these new methods called machine learning methods, of which my university is a, pine, is a pioneering place. I could go on at length about that, but I'm very skeptical about whether even those methods are effective, would be effective. And then finally, I'll, I'll make the point which is relevant uh, to our discussion here is that years ago, uh, the, this, there's an idea of stochastic selectivity, which Al Bloomstein, a graduate student at, at my university made, and it basically caught, made the following point, that if you have a high rate offender like this, they're committing enough crimes, they're eventually gonna get caught, and they're gonna be put in prison that way, so they're gonna, they're gonna sell, get themselves incarcerated. And so the, the bottom you know, line of, of, of this is that, is that you do not need mass incarceration uh, to, mass incarceration is not an, an efficient and effective way of, of preventing crime. Um, and in the case of the US, we are turning our, our prisons into old age homes. In the last, uh, over the last three, uh, 20 years, the percentage of offenders who are over 45 has tripled from 10% to more to close to 30%. Finally, you might say, well, uh, if, uh, if, if we're not gonna use prison to incapacitate, maybe there's some kind of deterrent effect. And here I wanna distinguish between two types of deterrents. One which, 
which, a, uh, which criminologists call specific deterrence, which Friedrich mentioned uh, in his presentation. And that has to do with how the experience of punishment, the actual experience of punishment affects your subsequent recidivism. And the, as the name, as the title suggests, the idea of specific deterrence is that it should somehow, it might have a chastening effect, that this is something you don't want to experience again. But there's good reasons for also arguing that it might have just the reverse kind of criminogenic effect. And uh, for another review of the literature that I did uh, uh, for, uh, for Mike in, in, the, uh, in the Crime and Justice series with Frank Cullen and Cheryl Cohen is where we looked at the evidence on the effect of the experience of, uh, uh, of, of, experience of imprisonment. And we came to the conclusion, quoted here, is that compared to non-custodial sanctions, incarceration either has a null, no effect on recidivism, or actually makes things worse. And while we cautioned that we, this wasn't a sufficiently strong conclusion to guide policy, it called into claim, wild claims, that imprisonment has a strong specific deterrent effect, which was, a, a, by the way, a theme in American politics at the time. I mean, it, many of these things were passed. So the other, um, the other source of uh, potential deterrence is that one might argue, and this goes, I mentioned Cesar Beccaria, and I can, now I should hear being in, in England, mention uh, Jeremy Bentham, is the idea of general deterrence. So it might be the case that even if actually punishing uh, Mike, uh, uh, we like to, I like to punish Mike, uh, uh, doesn't uh, have a deterrent effect. Maybe there's a symbolic impact for the general population uh, that, that causes them to frame from crime. And in that regard, it, it's important to distinguish between the certainty and severity of punishment, a, a distinction that both Macari and, and, uh, and Bentham made more than 250 years ago. In looking at the literature on um, the uh, on what we know about the deterrent effect of sentence length, uh, which is the severity component of it, is that the studies there find that the incremental deterrent effect of long sentences is either small or or non-existent. So that having using long sentences is not an effective way of deterring people. Now let me turn to certainty, uh, the certainty uh, of punishment. Is the conventional wisdom in this, the conventional wisdom, which actually even goes back to Bentham, in, in fact, is that, that the certainty of punishment, not the severity of, the, of punishment, is the more effective deterrent. And when I, uh, in my review of the, the literature, I came to a, an important conclusion that, you had, that there had to be an important revision to the uh, to the certainty argument, and it builds from the, the, the following observation, is that the certainty of punishment is the result of a series of probabilities that closely correspond to the construction of the criminal justice system. So if somebody commits a crime, um, for them to be punished, they have to be apprehended, which is mostly about what the police do, and once they're apprehended, they have to be convicted, and once they're convicted, uh, they have to be punished in some fashion. So let's think about imprisonment given conviction and um, uh, arrest uh, and conviction. There is very good evidence that the police, if properly mobilized, and I emphasize properly mobilized, can have a very substantial deterrent effect. And that's been discussed by various speakers already at at this conference. There is no evidence on whether increasing the risk of conviction, given you're apprehended, whether that has a deterrent effect. And, um, and the evidence simply does not support sending somebody to prison given you're arrested and convicted has a deterrent effect. I emphasize that last point, at least in the American context, we have many laws mandating the use of imprisonment given you're convicted of a certain crime. And there's no evidence that uh, that, 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 that has a deterrent effect. And so that led me to a revision 
of the certainty principle, which I think has very important policy consequences. And that is that it's the certainty of apprehension, not the severity of the ensuing consequences that is the most effective deterrent. And um, this conclusion uh, has two, I think, very important policy implications. Uh, one is, that I've further echoed, is that increasing certainty length, severe, the severity of punishment, is, is not going to, to have a deterrent. But it's also the case that, again, repeating myself, that laws mandating certain kinds of punishment post-apprehension, there's no evidence that those are effective de deterrents either. And so what this does is that it puts, it puts the police in terms of the actors within the criminal justice system that can affect crime rates. It puts the police on center stage. Uh, so just some notes about this is, uh, on, I'm not, uh, there are other people who have, have recognized this. Uh, uh, Anthony Kennedy, more than 10 years ago, commented on American criminal justice policy that our resources are misspent, our punishments too severe, our sentences too long. Um, uh, a year ago, about a year ago at this time, the U.S. Attorney General said too many Americans go to too many prisons for far too long for no good law enforcement reason. And so, Getting back to uh, my point of the opening question, when, uh, and I think the inevitable error of rising crime rates will occur, is how should the criminal justice system respond? It, and one way it shouldn't respond is by increasing sentence lengths. Although I didn't have time to talk about it, uh, I don't think it should also respond by sending more drug offenders to prison. Um, and what, how it should respond is, is describing here is the, is the strategic mobilization of the police to deter crime in the first place. And the key point here is if they can deter crime in the first place, if nobody, no crime occurs, there's nobody to arrest and, punishment and punish. And so therefore, society avoids both the cost of crime and the cost of punishment. And so in that way, this is analogous to an early childhood prevention program. It has it with, with, this, with the same consequences. I'll stop here because I think I'm close to the end of my 20 minutes. And there's a parallel session going on um, uh, on policing. But I want to emphasize what I mean by uh, moving police to the center stage here. So what I am talking about is the effective use of police in a democratic society. So we want low and effective use of, of police in a democratic society. We don't want a police state. Um, and how to go about doing that you know, is, 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 not, um, is not an easy matter, but maybe we can talk about that separately. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. And immediate questions are, are welcome for comments on, on the DSA. Yes, sir. Specifically, I'm uh, thinking about uh, Latin America and low and middle income countries development the <coughs> paradigms. It sounds easier said than done. And uh, I, I'm not saying it can be done, but what would be some of your thoughts for strategic mobilization of police forces to deter crime in situations where uh, they might, uh, not might, but they are involved in crime and they, there is uh, strong links of those forces. I, that's a very good question. Um, as I indicated um, last week, I was in Bogota, Colombia, uh, with uh, Daniel Ortega, who's in a parallel session right now. And the reason I was, I, I was there was I was asked to um, uh, to comment on a report by the CAF, the Inter Latin American Interdevelopment Bank, on a report on, on, on just this issue. Um, and, uh, and I closed there, I had a little bit more time to close, to expand upon my final set of comments about not wanting a police state. I, I don't, 
my, uh, I, I hesitate to answer your question in any detail because my experience with Latin America is a total of probably being there for three weeks. The one thing I, I, I did do before I went was I did, I did the best I could in getting a, a poll, which is not uh, systematic, but I polled my Latin American students about what they thought about the police. <laughs> And, um, and and Latin and and I interestingly got very, pretty very, you know, some very you know, real variability in in, 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 in in the responses and and it was kind of best summarized by a Brazilian colleague of mine who grew up in the rural in a rural area in Brazil you know and he said there they trusted the police and that they trusted that, you know, that they, the police were somebody that they could go to and protect them. But when he went to the university in Rio de Janeiro, his standing, the rule there was, if you see the police coming, cross the street and, you know, and, and, and stay away from them. And is that, so that all of the evidence on police being effective in in, in, in preventing crime through various kinds of strategies which we could uh, talk about um, are all from Western countries with well-functioning and well-regulated regulated democracies. And so where the kinds of extremes that you're talking about in South America just don't happen. Um, and so until the, the, this, this, the states is mobilized and the police in particular, have some degree of legitimacy, the kind of recommendation I'm making just can't be acted upon because they're not capable of, uh, of doing what I'm, what, what I'm speaking of here. So that's a very long, maybe unnecessarily long answer to your question. Yeah. Of course, you know that I agree with most of your views. I only don't see that the left column, the logical consequences is necessarily the right one. So it's only the police that needs to be mobilized. For instance, when we go in the direction of sentence lengths, we can also say the criminal justice system should not increase sentence lengths, but should try to reduce them. And we have alternative measures in the committee that really function. Pure diversion is also not doing well, because we know the uh, decarceration of the mentally ill led to an increase of the prison population in the United States and in other countries. In Italy, we have the same phenomenon. So, uh, why do you not add also a more differentiated reaction on the criminal justice side and not only on the police side? It's not popular because Minister of Justice Clark in this country has recommended it some years ago and he was blamed by the media. So it's, it's very difficult. Well, let me uh, uh, well, respond in two ways, is, or two points. The, the idea of in, in, increasing sentence lengths, uh, in just a short presentation, I also meant by that simply just sending more people to prison, okay? So on that score, you know, it was, it, that was shorthand for that. But, but, um, but, what, I, what should be on the slide, or maybe that as a, deep, you know, to, as a point of clarification should also be on the slide, but what is expressly not on the slide, which I think should, should be, bears on your presentation before lunch. That, uh, that when you incarcerate people, and, and, and there is a need to car incarcerate people, uh, if only for the, because of the seriousness of the crime that they committed, that you do something constructive with them when they're there, you know, to try to, to address the reasons, you know, for, for why they got in prison, either because of poor impulse control and or drug use and so forth. And that, I would agree, is a point that was, it really is missing from the slide. Could I perhaps just ask one question from my side? I, I was struck in Papua New Guinea, um, and, and I'm sure it happens in, in, in in other societies as well, the use of private security firms. So in Papua New Guinea, 5,300 police, uh, they, they're increasing it to 8,000, but more than 20,000 private security people. 
Um, and and, and uh, I think there, there are obviously problems about, in a way, outsourcing the task of the state. Mm -hmm. But the argument from the, from the government side is that if we don't have these private security people to guard, for example, buildings and so forth, we can't really prevent crime in, and we have to redeploy our people in order to do that. Uh, how would you see the role of private security firms in this context? I think that's another very good, 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 good question. Is private security, let's say, in, in a well-regulated you know, society has a role, um, uh, which is different than, you know, you know, than, than, than police, uh, than, than what the police should be doing. You know, private security, you know, um, at a, a sporting event, you know, you know in, in Western Europe or the United States or guarding a, a garage, has a, a prop, which is diff not something I, I think is an efficient and effective way of, uh, uh, a pro that the police should be doing. But again, getting back to my recent visit to, uh, to, to South America in Bogota, and I suspect it would be the same, I've never been to South Africa, but from what I read it would be the same, is that the, the security forces in other situations are there providing protection that should properly be being provided <coughs> by you know, uh, the, the state-run police force which is it's not being provided either because of inadequate resources for them or because as the gentleman in the back pointed out, they're, they're part of the problem. It's not, it's not an issue of a shortage of police and there's no shortage of police in Latin America. They're, on a per capita basis, there are more police per capita in Latin America than most Western countries. If the problem with them is, is what they're doing um, and, and private security is a response, and oftentimes a response, to them doing nothing or even worse. 